On this fifth Sunday of Lent, we come together as God's people, inspired by the call of God to help God's written word become a living word as it flows through us. As we gather today, I invite you to go to the description of this video where you can find the, a link to today's bulletin so you may actively participate in worship. Also, please have your elements for communion ready so that you may partake when that time comes, if you so choose. I also want to lift up one of the mission activities that is currently taking place. We are in the midst right now of collecting our Easter blessing bags, bags that have been uh, um, given so that we might help others know the fullness of a, a belly at the same time as knowing the fullness of the Easter joy from Christ. And we invite you to come to the church, take a bag, an empty bag that lists with it the foods to fill it with, and then return that bag to us as soon as possible possible so we may be able to take it to the local food pantry to help others know the warmth of God's love. Let us now begin our service with the order of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit gathers us together as the people of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you are. Let us pray. O oh God, with steadfast love you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for the fifth Sunday in Lent is from Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Here ends the first reading. The Holy Gospel for this fifth Sunday in Lent, according to John. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. 
but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Here ends the Holy Gospel. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There was a boy named Francis, grew up in the 12th century. He was the son of a very wealthy silk merchant. And Francis one day was manning his father's booth, selling the silk, when a beggar came up to him and asked for help, asked for some money, some alms. A very common trend at the time in which Francis lived. But Francis quickly dismissed the beggar. But he couldn't get the image of the beggar out of his head. And so, as soon as the business day was over, he ran off, abandoning the booth, to go hunt down the beggar, and he found him not too far away. And then young Francis emptied his pockets, giving everything that he had in there to the beggar. Now, this act was seen by some of Francis's friends who mocked him. And when he went home to his father, his, he told his father about the act, and his father scolded him deeply, because that's not the right way to live. That's not the livelihood of a merchant. A few years later, Francis is in a sanctuary praying, and he feels convicted at that moment to give generously to that church so that it might be rebuilt as the walls and ceilings were caving in. So he goes to his father again and gets some silk and goes out and sells it and then returns back to the church with the profits from that silk, giving it to them. But Again, his father, upon hearing the news, gets furious this time. How could Francis not learn his, his lesson the first time? And so his father beats him. His father then locks him up in a storeroom. However, Francis's mother has mercy on him and, and opens up the storeroom and sets him free. But Francis' father is still dedicated on bringing Francis to justice for dare, dare violating the foundation of their lifestyle and their livelihood. So his father brings charges towards Francis, asking him to renounce his inheritance as a punishment for his action of generosity. And that's where, before the court, Legend has it that Francis not only renounces his inheritance, but renounces his family and also strips himself naked so that nothing that he has and is wearing, nothing at all, has been provided to him from his father. He gives up essentially the entire lifestyle into which he was born. I tell this story because it reminded me a little bit of our gospel story today because Jesus in it tells this parable, this teaching about not loving one's own life. Now, I don't interpret this and scholars don't interpret this to say that we should not love life itself. No. God created us to, with the gift of life. Christ came so that we might know life. Yes, this is not saying that we should abhor life itself, but instead, instead it does bring with it a warning. It does call us not to live according to love of one's lifestyle. 
All the things that people see and all the things that they clamor for that seem to make the good life. Yeah, the cars, the clothes, the acclaim, the money, the wealth the good looks, the whatever it might be, all these things that from the outside seem like life, these are things that Jesus warns us against loving. Because Jesus knows, Jesus knows that there's great temptation to love this lifestyle even more than we love God. Yes, the lifestyles we have can tempt us to put things in the place of God, to replace God with material things or things that are acclaimed by others. And this temptation was very much there for Francis, the son of a merchant. He was set. He had been born into a wealthy family. All he had to do was to learn the trade and to apply it. And as he learned the trade, he learned the rules of the trade. No, a self, a, a good merchant does not give away their profits, especially to the poor. No, a good merchant keeps its profits. A good merchant builds on its profits. And if Francis would have just succumbed to this guidance, this wisdom, he could have lived a nice, comfortable, cushy life. But the sense that Francis gives is that that cushy, comfortable life still would not have filled his calling. And it's here where the gospel lesson speaks with such great power. Loving our lifestyles is something that comes natural because our lifestyles are very comfortable. Yeah, we we like to buy new things. We like to have things. We seek out those things that make it comfortable and easy for us to continue on day to day. However, sometimes comfort has the ability to leave us feeling unfulfilled. Because these comforts that we want, these comforts that they, we accumulate, we keep on wanting and needing more and more and more of them. So we work ourselves after more and more and more of them. And then we, we, we're stuck in a life full of taking care of those comforts that we so often desire and that we give up everything for. And eventually, eventually we come to this realization that all the comforts of this worldly lifestyle leave us completely and utterly unsatisfied. It's impossible to satisfy the craving of the world that says more and more, bigger and better. But Jesus, Jesus knows, knows a way towards satisfaction, a way towards fullness. And this path, this lifestyle is one focused on serving God and serving others. It's not chasing around for the trappings of this world, but instead, instead, giving ourselves over to godly purposes. The godly purpose, particularly, of loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. But giving up the trappings of a worldly lifestyle, well, it's hard. It's hard. Francis, in every action he did that gave up that worldly lifestyle, he was, he was mocked by his friends. He was scorned and beaten and imprisoned by his own family. He was looked at by the community as a complete and utter failure. And just as this path is hard for Francis, so it is hard for us. There are many, many in our world. Its definition of success is giving in completely and wholly to loving a lifestyle based off the trappings of this world, of giving in to that temptation to more and more, bigger and better. And when when you live counter to that, or when you take a step out of line to that, you certainly, certainly risk scorn and ridicule, even hatred, as people have become so good at throwing stones at one another. Yeah. When you step away from the norm of loving the lifestyle that the world says you should love, you do take a great risk. But but this lifestyle does not only come with a great risk, it also comes with a great reward. Jesus, in the lesson today, highlights how a grain of wheat falls to the ground. 
and, and is buried, and it dies to its own life. Yeah, it dies to its own life. But in doing so, it produces fruit, fruit that fills others, fruit that, that is far more than what the one seed or grain could have been on ourselves. And so it is that not loving our lifestyle and submitting to the godly life of serving others, it likewise produces fruit. It produces fruit for us. We get to be part of something that is far greater than ourselves. We get to be part of God's loving, caring relationships when we submit to a godly life of serving God and serving others. And these relationships, these relationships, they become defined by service and love. And you know what they do? They bring with it a joy, the sweetest of all fruits, that brings with it satisfaction, that brings with it, with it a, a fullness and a fulfilled nature. Yes. This is the gift that comes from submitting not to a worldly lifestyle, but instead to the godly lifestyle. And then the other thing is this godly lifestyle, this giving up of our own lifestyle for that of God, it produces fruit that enlivens others. The seed lays down its life so that it might be generously harvested to accompany, to provide for to, to help others. And so it is that that great grain of wheat that came and sacrificed itself for us is Jesus. And what do we learn from that life? We learn that Jesus' death and resurrection to new life helped us to also grow to know life, to know a life that is sweet, to know a life with hope, to know a life with joy. And so it is that we ourselves are called to respond to that gift that Jesus has given us by being part of that gift for others. To help others know hope. To help others know satisfaction. To help others know a way outside of this worldly lifestyle, but instead dedicated to serving and loving their neighbor as themselves and reflecting the glory of God. I return back to Francis. I think of him at that moment naked in the courtroom. And by all worldly standards, at that moment, his life was a life completely and utterly lost. He had been disowned. He had no inheritance. He was naked. He was poor. He may as well have been dead in the eyes of the world. But, but he did not commit himself to a worldly lifestyle, into loving a worldly life, but instead, from that moment forward, he committed himself to living a godly lifestyle, to loving God above all other things. He committed himself to going around and restoring chapels, finding stones from the area, and bringing them so that they might be part of restoring these great chapels and sanctuaries. And then from there, he also developed a great, uh, af or a great intrigue and a great faithful life where he dedicated himself to poverty, to, to not getting wrapped up in the, the trappings of the world, an affront on the lifestyle that says more and more, bigger and bigger. And in the doing so, he attracted others as they gave up the worldly lifestyle for a lifestyle of service and community. And, and, and as this continued to grow and grow and grow, the seeds of faith and the seeds of God continued to grow and grow and grow, and more and more people and communities were touched by that love of Christ. Because Francis, you probably have heard of him before. Yeah, Francis did a lot of his work around the city of Assisi in Italy. And so if you know Francis of Assisi, the individual who founded the Franciscan order of communities based around living in poverty and serving their neighbor and serving God, then you understand the way that that seed, that that grain, which dies to itself to live in Christ, can impact the world. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating for a mass conversion or a cloistered lifestyle for everybody. But I think Francis does serve as an example of, of the fruit that is possible when the Word of God becomes the living Word of God as it's embodied through people. 
And so that brings me to my prayer for you and to the inspiration that I hope that you take from our time today as you contemplate your Lenten journey and how it is to live in this world as a person of faith. May you, may you be part of helping God's written word become God's living word. May you rise each day to love the life that God gives you, but not the lifestyle that supplants God's will. May you follow the example of Christ, leading a lifestyle of of service, so that the seeds of our lives may produce God's sweet, gracious, caring, and loving fruit for our world. Amen. of faith here today we gather with the saints of all times and all places confessing our common faith through the words of the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ God's only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers today, we uplift all those who've experienced hospitalization, illness, or other challenge this last week, or have such challenges on the horizon. Today, we pray for Sandra Lignell, Hank Paulson, Chuck Kraut, Frank Bort, Art Glick, Vicki Wilk, Ruth Sava, Connor Mish, Matt Hussar, Sandy Sant, Richard Wolf, Char Wolf, Susan Miskovic, Bob Murphy, Hugh Higgins, Kim Beckman, 
Barb Bowie, Bob Stevens, Sue Overby, Ainsley Maisk, Tella Puckhammer, Sam Barbro, Betty Pasca, Corinne Delaney, Peter Gorski, Nancy Garfinkel, Connie Zajakowski, Florence Satori, Joan Hoffman, Virginia Kerr, John Kerr, Glenn Spockman, Carol Hale, Joseph Travis, Laura Dolsky, Eric Mayers, Ron Kelly, Marilyn Kinstead, Gretchen Bishop, Dale Cook, Don Knights, Elaine Girton, Carol Kidd, Crispin Bowfinger, Samantha King, Violet Fywig, Daniel Shilney Jr., Megan Ebby, Richard Scott, Otis Vinson, Elizabeth Johnson, Mark McCormick, Dan Credit, Lorraine Wells, and Keith Binka. We also lift up in our prayers the bereaved. We, we pray for the, the Crowell family upon the passing of uh, Barb's mother, Vivian Howe. And we pray for the Merrick and Trost family upon the passing of their uh, relative and our beloved member, uh, Martin Leprich Jr. We also lift up in our prayers the Sweeney and Holke family upon the passing of our, our member, Betty Holke. We do lift up in celebration today the marriage of Mark Priest and Barbara Straub. And we also lift up in our prayers those who serve our country and our communities. Relying on the promise of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. You wash us through and through and remember our sin no more. Make your church a community of forgiveness throughout the world. Give your people courage to forgive. Through them, show the world new possibilities. Bless ministries of repentance and reconciliation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You fill the earth from tiny grains of wheat to the mighty thunder with your presence, and you call us to attend to your will for all creation. Grant weather that prepares the soil for seeds. Protect all from violent storms, flooding, and wildfires. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You promise to write your law on our hearts. Guide citizens throughout the world to shape communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace. And give them creativity to work for the welfare of all. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Restore the joy of all who need to know your presence those who are lonely or feel unforgivable, those who are in need of healing of mind or body, those who are dying and all who grieve. We pray especially for Sandra, Hank, Chuck, Frank, Vicki, Ruth, Connor, Matt, Sandy, Richard, Char, Susan, Bob, Hugh, Kim, Barb, Bob, Sue, Ainsley, Tella, Sam, Betty, Corinne, Peter, Nancy, Connie, Florence, Joan, Virginia, John, Glenn, Carol, Joseph, Laura, Eric, Ron, Marilyn, Rich, Gretchen, Dale, Dawn, Elaine, Carol, Crispin, Samantha, Violet, Daniel, Megan, Richard, Otis, Elizabeth, Mark, Dan, Lorraine, and Keith, and the family and friends of Vivian, and Martin, and Betty. And for all those who serve our country and our communities, guide their efforts according to your will. Return those who are away home safely and sustain their families as they set out in service to us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Jesus calls us to follow him in life and death. <coughs> Empower your church here in Coronationville and around the world to be faithful in discipleship. Equip children and teachers in Sunday school, confirmation, and learning ministries. Give us your truth and wisdom, and teach us to follow Jesus. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You gift us with love in Christ. Bless all relationships, except especially that of Mark and Bridget, that they may express your love now and always. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. May that peace be felt for you today. May you know it, may it bring you comfort, and may it bring you joy. Now is the time in our service we traditionally receive our offering. We give 
an abundant thanks for the generosity shown by the Good Shepherd community towards God's work through the congregation. We invite you to continue in that faithful practice, um, whether it's financially or whether it's through the Easter blessing bags or whether it's just through contributing to a godly lifestyle in the community around you that others may know the joy and love and the abundant provision of God. And know that if this is a time of struggle, your church is here to help you, to be with you, to supply whatever we are able so that you may know God's love in real and tangible ways. Let us pray. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we share of this meal, we remember Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus draws the whole world to himself. Come to this meal and be fed. For those of you not partaking in the sacrament of communion, may the Lord bless you and keep you until the day of your receiving through Christ Jesus. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you the body of Christ given for me. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for me. Now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and forever keep you in God's grace. Amen. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine upon us with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.